Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking about, and we're going to be asking questions, probably not answering some of the questions, which I'll leave to you during the course of the evening to find out for yourself, about the Sydney Convention and Exhibition Centre. You'll probably see during my slides that I've actually got the word Darling Harbour. The reason is I'm not allowed to use the word Sydney Convention and Exhibition Centre, so that's part of the challenges that we've faced during this entire process. Uh, firstly, thank you to the Institute of Architects for giving this a home because this has actually been a project that many people didn't want to see on a wall, and, uh, which is quite upsetting in lots of ways and part of the much bigger picture I'll be talking about. Thank you to Phil Cox and also Russell Lee who will be talking uh, later during the course of this as well, and Joe Ages and Roswell Irons from the Institute that have made this happen. A bit about me, I'm Stephen Pearce. I am one of the photographers with James Kenny, who's amongst you who actually uh, went and photographed the Convention Exhibition Centre from top to tail. A bit of my, my background is I've been a professional, semi-professional photographer for a number of years, but a lot of the work I've done has actually been in the built environment area. I have some basic architectural training, uh, but I've worked in both Sydney Harbour Foreshore Authority, a large number of local governments and also state government in asset management and built environment systems, processes, and all that sort of stuff, but don't hold that against me. The other photographer was James Kenny. Uh, James works as part of SPP and also his own pro is also his own projects as well. And this is part of a, a, a series of projects we've got called Remembering. And this is the ability or the, the need to go and capture heritage now. Because a lot of projects like these, a lot of buildings like these, actually don't get recorded before they disappear. Originally, the uh, purpose for photographing the convention centre, the exhibition centre, was actually to help to stop them being demolished, but unfortunately we were unsuccessful in doing that. But in doing so, we realised that there actually wasn't a record of a lot of these buildings. So our aim was actually to take that record and put it in the public arena. So, a bit of background is, you know, as long as there's been photography, people have been pointing at buildings. And one of the reasons for that is buildings don't talk back. But also because there's a commonality between space and light, and if you like, we'll call them cousins. And so they lend themselves quite well, and many amongst you as architects have used photography as a means to explain your work, to celebrate your work, and also to publish your work out to a greater audience. And government has also used it as a way of recording assets or things of note uh, for Posterity for future gener for future generations, and that started very early on in the piece uh, with the earliest days of photography. And some of the architects or the architects involved in the convention centre used photography quite extensively in the early days of the development of these sites and actually building them. And thank you to Lisa Moore also for uh, access to David Moore's work on the early work of the exhibition centre. But it stopped. In the 1980s and early 1990s, a lot of the work that was done by photographers in that era disappeared and disappeared with those photographers. And if you go out and have a look in the public domain and have a look at a lot of our notable public buildings, there is no public record available of them. And while they may have been photographed, many of them live in drawers or they live in private organisations and they're not available for people to understand what they were about, understand their processes. And also, as architects, that means that people aren't informed as to what the benefits were, what the design theories were, what the principles were that built some of these buildings. And so the process of educating people about education has really, in some ways, stopped beyond media management. While there are photographs that are used to tell people what a site is like to sell something or to, you know, be controlled by government to say how wonderfully they're spending our money, to actually celebrate the architecture, celebrate the space, and to educate people, that to a large extent, photographically, has stopped. Having a look at photographers that are coming through from the industry, a lot of them do not choose architectural photography. And the reason why they don't choose architectural photography, because it's a very small space, it's a very limited opportunity, and that is because they aren't being engaged to actually photograph work and put it out there for people to see and understand. When is the last time, other than today obviously, where you actually saw an exhibition of architectural photography? 
whether it be 20th century or this century or whatever, where actually you can put it in the public face, where people can actually understand and celebrate the work you do as architects and see how that links in with community, links in with people, and links into how our city evolves. And one of the reasons for that is digital photography. And this is what a lot of people are referring to as the, the age without a history. So while we have lots of photographs of people's breakfasts and people walking down the street and various other things, notable public spaces aren't being recorded. Every man and his dog has a camera in their phone or they have an SLR, but they're pointing it at the wrong things. They're pointing at things that we don't necessarily want to keep for posterity. And so the important things like the convention centre and the exhibition centre don't get recorded. So the decisive moment happened for James and I, like many great things, over a beer, where we decided and we heard that both the Convention Centre and the Exhibition Centre were going to be pulled down. And we were both aware of David Moore's work and actually liked that work because that was a heavy influence on the kind of things we wanted to do, that is architecture and people and spaces and communities and how they interact. So we went and had a look. And we realised that there was no publicly available record other than David's Moore work of the exhibition of the Convention Centre. And in fact, with the Convention Centre, there was actually nothing out there available. Yet, these buildings are going to disappear from our city. So James and I decided to take our weapon of choice, which is our camera, and have the battle. And it is a battle because the doors did not open freely. The spaces weren't made available to us. But these were things that need to be recorded. And along the way, lots of people have helped us and would like to thank them. And these are the people that have left doors open for us, given us security cards to go to places we weren't meant to go to, and given us access on the last day of the building before it uh, was handed over to the demolition team. So thank you to those people who I assume aren't there. So David's Moore, David Moore's work celebrated built environment, the people involved in built environment, the construction of it, and the interaction with the city. And this was our starting point. Unfortunately, because of the, the age we live in, the ability to photograph people in public spaces or in private spaces is somewhat limited. So we, wouldn't, we weren't able to incorporate some of the concept that data brought forward of people in public spaces or people in buildings. We had to just concentrate on the building, but we didn't want to have a stylized rendering where we were singing to the choir. Because architecturally, if we shoot the building as a piece only of architecture, the only people it was going to appeal, it was going to, appeal to were architects and you already know. So we wanted a much wider audience. And that wider audience meant we had to go and get this on a wall. We had to take it out of the digital realm, we had to put it on a wall, and we had to make it available for people to see. One of the other things about from the last time the exhibition center was shot, there were 20 or 30 <coughs> images available because it was film based. We had the benefit of, and we have the, and all of you have access to the ability to generate thousands of images. Now, while that might not necessarily be seen as a good thing, it enabled us to capture every corner of the space, not just the places that the public sees, not just the, the halls, not just the, uh, the auditoriums, but also things like the change rooms and the places where people keeping, kept the lighting equipment going in their own time, the people that worked there. So coming back to what David Moore brought to it, celebrating the people that are sitting in the lighting rooms and the architecture and the place. So our project aims were to have a public record of the entire interior and exterior of the convention centre. We actually achieved that except for the roof spaces and we actually tried 12 times to get to the roof spaces but unfortunately the security guards ran too fast. <laughs> The second part of that was to have a public discussion and an exhibition around the demolition of the convention centre and ask the questions that seem to have not been asked. Can't provide necessarily the answers, but as I said at the beginning of this presentation, it's hopefully something where you can go out and find out for yourself. The third part of this is actually to take these images beyond the walls outside and actually put them into the public domain. As I said, they're available through the Powerhouse Museum, but we'll also be doing a publication on this for those people that uh, are interested in having a look at some stage in the future.
and to make some money. Now the obstacles for this, I mentioned before about the obstacles we had. We approached many levels of government to be able to get access to these buildings. Uh, both Sydney Harbour Foreshore Authority Infrastructure New South Wales and also the new contractors involved in uh, the new site. And most of them, or if not all of them, said no. They actually did not want this to be photographed. And some of the reasons were because what they wanted to put forward was the new vision, the new future, the new progression beyond what was there already and Dan Heritage. <laughs> the other thing was that a lot of people that actually did say yes in the end required us to have site escorts. <coughs> because a lot of the things around dilapidation, especially the exhibition centre, around fire control and security, we were not permitted to photograph in case they got out. So the roof space, for example, of the exhibition centre and the issues around leakage, etc., we were stopped from actually going and photographing that to actually show what the state was at the time of their demolition. The most, in a way, upsetting was of the people I spoke to, from architects, through to the people that maintain the site, through to government, through to photographers, was why would you want to photograph that? <coughs> and unfortunately, I think that is something that, as architects, you suffer from, and as photographer, I certainly suffer from, is people understanding the relevance and the context of where we have come from, not just what is going to be built tomorrow. And I think that, and this project is part of an effort to actually turn some of that around to say, yes, those buildings were of value. They did make a contribution. They came a long way from the railway sheds that were at Darling Harbour before. And as I spoke about with media management and control of images, most of the organisations said, yes, as long as we can tell you which images you can use. I said no. And to all those people that actually got in the way, I'd like to say, ha. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> Again, thank you to Lisa Moore for access to a range of these images you'll see tonight. Um, part of it is also a lot of the people that I spoke to about the exhibition and convention centre didn't know where it came from. They're my age, 40, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> And they don't remember what was there before. And how far both those structures took from basically a disused harbourside railway yard into something that families could go to, part that, something that became an integral part of the city we live in. Um, and interestingly, I, also there's absolutely no traffic in that, which I find quite amusing. And that also shows you how much the city has changed in the 30 years since that photograph was taken. Things like the helipad, for those that remember the helipad that was down there, which was a good idea if you liked helicopters. And also the fact that the, the rail shed down there was the second largest iron building up, and was well, the largest iron building up until the construction of the Eiffel Tower. We never hear about that. This was a rare opportunity to capture and study a very public birth of a project. And as Neville Rand said, and we'll talk about these cursed words a little later, an opportunity to return the industrial site back to the people of Sydney. We had the opportunity to actually study and photograph its operation, how it was used. So from its early instances, how it was operated, to unfortunately, what is no longer there. I don't think there'll be much relaxation done in front of that sign to the sound of augers and jackhammers and various other things. So why was it done? It was done to capture the places not seen by people. The public places, there were some records of those, they were done for PR purposes, but it was to show the depth of thought, the depth of the design that went into these structures all the way through. And also to demonstrate how operational change condemns good buildings where the infamous change to hall, the kitchen to Hall 6 started a process which ultimately may have led to its demolition. 
to also celebrate the people getting back to what David Moore did. Celebrate the people that worked there for 25 years, that made it work, that made it a living, breathing thing. It's more than just the structure, it's more than just the architecture. It was how this, these buildings were built to life. And also, to capture a time and place. The best time to capture heritage is now. And we'll value it in 25 years' time or 50 years' time, but if we don't do it now, we won't have that to fall back on. We won't learn the lessons of where we came from. The curse of the gifts of government. As I said, Neville Rand said, we're going to do Darling Harbour as a gift to the people of Sydney. For any architects out there, let me give you a word of advice. That if you have a, a notary or a, a, a member of parliament or someone significant say, this is, your building has been built as a gift to the people of Sydney, I think I'd have a look at the track record of those words. Firstly, the Convention Exhibition Centre. Before that, the Garden Palace, which was also a gift to the people of Sydney, which we can't visit, obviously. The Sesky Centenary Pavilion at Moore Park, which as built as an exhibition centre in a way, for us as a present to the people of Sydney, is no longer publicly available. If you wish to see the, the stained glass, you can do so behind a security gate, if you're lucky. And of course, the Convention Exhibition Centre, which is now gone. I was having a look the other day at, uh, in the archive of the Sydney Morning Herald, and the words that we used to open the Bauhaus Museum doesn't look good. <laughs> Interestingly, one of the things that came up in talking to people about why we were photographing this project is, well, it has to go because we want it to be bigger. What else would we do with it? And fortunately, um, in January, I witnessed one of SPSP's finest whizzing around on the ice on the Grand Palais in Paris, and I had an answer given to me. Why do we have to demolish why do we have to hide? And why do we have to sell things when there are other purposes for them? Why aren't we repurposing these for other things? Other, other countries seem to do it quite well. From the photographic side of things, and we'll get into that part of it, there were a lot of challenges around this. And some of these challenges weren't just photographic. Some of these challenges were operational challenges. For example, the last day of the exhibition centre running and we wished to take a photograph from Hall 5 to Hall 1 and one of the petitions was closed. So we asked, could we get someone to open the petition? They said, oh, that's outsourced. <laughs> we have to call a man or call a person that comes in a van that's going to charge us an amount of money to open the door so we don't break it on the last day of its operation. <laughs> Fortunately, one of these helpful souls, we had a word to, we disappeared, went and had a walk and came back, and then miraculously it was open later on. So those people that made it happen, thank you very much. So the scale was very hard to, from a photographic perspective, because they were vast. But also because operationally, these buildings were still running. <clears throat> and from a convention centre perspective, the change in elevation, the height, was also very hard to capture because while it was uh, the line of sight enabled you to see it quite easily, photographically it was very hard to capture it. And this was about capturing the character of these places. Fortunately, we had, as I said, these people that gave us magic cards that enabled us to get to places and find things that weren't designed to be publicly visible, publicly accessible. But these were places that was special, that had appeal to them, but they weren't recorded. This is the inside of one of the uh, fire stairs at the convention centre, inside the glazing. And again, we went for a walk and came back and miraculously the door was left open for us. And by going and exploring these things without permission, which is an issue in itself, we we're able to find some of these things apart from access to the roof for obvious issues. So one of the challenges photographically is while we can get permission eventually to actually go and discover what is of appeal, what is of interest, 
shouldn't be left to those that media manage the photographers. It should be left to those who actually go and discover it and find out the quiet places and find out the special places that someone else may not have decided to be important or, or appreciated at all. One of the things about the convention centre and the exhibition centre, and one thing that was very much missing from the record is how they changed from the morning to the afternoon to the night, and how they integrated with the entire site. And so part of the project was to capture all of this at six o'clock in the morning, at one o'clock in the afternoon, and at eight o'clock at night, because they had very different characters, and they served very different purposes for the eating spaces, for the convention spaces and also for the exhibition spaces, change their character and change their usage as the day progressed. These sites ran 18 hours a day. And they behaved differently within those time spots. And the other challenge was it was operational. And it was operational until the day it closed. This is a photograph of the preparation of the Last Supper for the one of the term. <laughs> before the staff went to the Grand Hall for their farewell Christmas party, three hours before the doors closed. So, what you don't see in this photograph is while there's chefs working in the, the kitchen spaces, on the other side of the wall, there were teams ripping out kitchens at the same time. And obviously they had a, a particular like for fire extinguishers in that court. <laughs> One, I had, did an interview with John Andrews in early February, which we'll be seeing in the video fairly shortly. And one of the things that um, he mentioned about, and I'm sure Philip and Russell will touch on as well, is the ability to expand these sites. And going in that discovery James and I did of those fire stairs, we found a flight and a half of stairs that led to nowhere. Mm -hmm. They led to the top, beneath the air conditioning plant, on the fire stairs. And in talking to John, the purpose was so they could be continued, so the building could be expanded, so it had capability to be grown. And without actually exploring that, they were just words. the infamous sixth hall. I had a, a long conversation with several pe operational people in the convention centre, and they said, this is where it all started. This particular hall is where the end of the convention centre, the exhibition centre started. The reason is, when the grand ballroom was put in in the Ken and Woolley extension in the uh, early, early century, they had a problem because the kitchen spaces were in the convention centre. And by the time they got the food from those kitchens to the grand ballroom, the food would be cold. An operational limitation not thought about when the site was expanded. So the solution was Hall 6. The solution was to move the kitchen spaces to Hall 6 and therefore people that were going for their you know, daughter's formal could get their, 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 get their meal warm. Um, and that is one of the conversations that led to things like the site being declared not working operationally, was the inability to get food from the cooking spaces through to the, the site when it was expanded as well, and the inability to actually turn Hall 6 into one of those operational and kitchen spaces. Um, anyway, that's what I was told. Interestingly, one of the other spaces we didn't get to for the same reasons as the roof was actually the lighting galleries. Because the lighting galleries gave us the ability to actually show the condition of the inside of the roof in the, in the convention centre. But there was an awful lot of lighting and sound equipment and a huge amount of staff that worked to make sure that these sites operated. These people, once the site had been closed, didn't go on to the new contract, they've gone elsewhere. So many of them spent you know, 25 years working in this environment 
And on that day, after that last Christmas party, after they last manned their desks, they went home and never to go back again. And interestingly, I'll talk about that a bit later, there's a lot of those spaces in a lot of buildings like the Opera House that just aren't recorded. One of the important things was the corporate spaces. And when we talk about the buildings being for the people of Sydney, um, we're also talking about the corporate aspect of the, uh, of the city and actually make it, and make it work. And a lot of these spaces were beautifully fitted out and well thought out. And these spaces, again, weren't recorded, so our job was to go, go forth and find them and actually to photograph them. And again, many of them uh, we were dissuaded from capturing. So if you look at the, the number of people that have worked in these centres over the period of time, from entertainers to presenters to you know, sales people to whatever, many of them have walked up these stairs. And it's these quiet spaces, these little corner places that needed to be recorded and so went lost forever. I've never seen so many dressing rooms in my life. <laughs> and one of them was used. So when people talk about the convention centre and how the space was used inefficiently, there were many spaces towards the end of its life that were underutilised, not repurposed. They were just sat there and locked away. And some of these dressing rooms hadn't been accessed for several years, but they were there, fitted out, ready to go. They could quite easily have been stripped and reused for another purpose, but were sitting there. And that was a, quite a common thing that we actually found at the convention centre. Lots and lots of little spaces that could quite easily have been converted and used for other things that were just sat there as they were on the day that they were intended and not moved on. You probably notice I'm more just a little cynical. So <laughs> this, this poster appealed to me on the very last day. A poster of a sustainable centre on the day the doors close. And I think a lot of people forget that both the Exhibition Centre and the Convention Centre moved the game on a lot for public buildings around energy saving and conservation. And I think a lot of that gets missed when people talk about what they actually contributed. And I think that's something that should be discussed more and prioritised more because it's obviously of an agenda now, but at the time it was probably less so. But they were there anyway. <laughs> One end of the building, someone's ripping out kitchens. Other end of the building, someone's washing windows. You, yes, I'm not going to say anything about management, but some decisions people make are quite amusing. Yeah. A lot of the areas, especially that the public engaged, were closed, were closed early, and they sat dressed, waiting for people to come through the door. Tables and chairs, bottles of wine sitting in fridges, cash registers turned on, yet no one was to come perfectly functional spaces that still served a purpose to people that wanted to come that weren't allowed to be used. Similarly with the dock space. And again, in the conversations I've had with many people that uh, were working there at the time about the, the dock space and the access to both the exhibition centre and the convention centre, Obviously there were some issues because of the, the nature of the site from, from, from the beginning. But many of them felt that in their ability to do what they needed to do to make the place operate, to bump in exhibitions, to actually provide food and services to the people that actually attended the convention centre, they actually were suitable for purpose. This was a very much a Mary Celeste moment. This was just before we walked out for the last time. And there was a uniform shop, high-vis, 
waiters' uniforms all lined up, waiting for people that were never going to come back in the door again. And it's those people that worked there that aren't discussed when we talk about the removal of these buildings from the site. And this is it, the last steps through the security door before the buildings went. Now, I haven't spent a great deal of time today talking about the architectural aspects of the photography that we did, because a lot of that's on the walls outside. Because that was only one aspect of what we were intending to do for the project. What we were intending to do the project was capture the people that worked there without actually showing them, because we're not allowed to. The way it interacted with the rest of Darling Harbour, and also what we were not going to be able to see again, a record. Interestingly, this is one of a number of projects that we've done, including um, uh, Sydney Water Building, uh, Metropolitan Water Series Drainage Board, Clare Hotel, various other things. There's actually a large number of buildings in Sydney that have no extensive photographic record. And some of those quite surprised me. For example, the Opera House, which is one of our most photographed buildings, great chunks of that have no public record. We have a lot from its construction, we have a lot from its operational, uh, from its entertainment spaces, but we have nothing or very little of its administrative and operational spaces. And as changes happen, like the, the changes happening in the Opera House for you know, access for loading bays and trucks and various other things, the projects happen there, Spaces like the painting spaces I was told will be gone. And there'll be no record for that. So the original work, the original intention behind these sites will be lost. So if you can get me into these buildings, please do. Because we'd like to take this record and we'd like to take it just beyond the convention centre to much more. So we have a record so we can go back in 25 years time and have a look at the work that you created, have a look at the community that you built and have a look at the city you made for us. Because what we've lost is a building by Australians for Australians and that doesn't happen often. There's some of other projects, so that's my project. My view. On the 17th of February, I went out and I went to Orange and had an interview with John Andrews. And um, those of you that have spoken to John or know John know that his opinion was somewhat forthright. And the, the bits that I've actually put to air, I'll be showing you fairly shortly. <laughs> By the way, audience participation is welcome. There's, there's a guy working in Leightons and he appointed both Philip Cox and myself. I got to do the convention centre, he got to do the exhibition building. Yeah. Uh, much to his screen, he wanted to do both. But, uh, but anyway, that typical. Let, let's say hello to Philip because he'll be watching this video. Yeah. Hello, Philip. Yeah, hey, Philip. I recall that uh, there was quite some attempt to uh, for the, uh, the two buildings to be done with the one architect. It didn't happen that way. Was Leighton's driving that? Leighton's are driving it to start with, yeah. Okay. I don't know where they finish that. How they? I, I didn't get in. I never got into that political stuff. I didn't play that game, you know. So mm -hmm. I, uh, much to my, my uh, you know, problem, I think I should have played it a lot more than I did. These meetings with uh, with so-called design types, you know that, uh, but. I don't know, we, we just sort of went ahead. We set the office up down. You, you know, I, I, I play a game with these bloody people. You know, they, uh, we, we bought a, a beautiful old ferry and I set it up as, a, uh, as, a, as an office. Originally it was a f f the ferry from uh, 
I think it was from Melbourne, from, uh, went from Geelong to Melbourne. That was, that was the original, you know, the first, so it was just a big old ferry, you know. And uh, that was our office down there. And I used to take people out for lunch on it and that sort of thing. I recall Andrew Anderson's coming out for lunch on the ferry and they, these guys, they loved it. They sort of, you know, it was the best way to deal with them. Yeah. We have your meeting on the ferry and you know, get some sandwiches or something and go up and down the... In fact, we used to get it catered depending on who it was for. And, you know, That's the, um, the, there were ways and means of doing things that sort of could... What do you mean? Well, I, you know, I could draw people's attention away from the thing they were most interested in, like trying to get you to do what they want you to do. I, I'd be more interested in getting them to do what I want them to do. So yeah, you, you, you accept some of these invitations for lunch on a boat on Sydney Harbour, you're not going to be much of a problem. Well, it's a much gentler time than now. now. If you're going to use a boat today, you use a fucking destroyer or something. <laughs> He lived here as a nice old ferry. The, uh, the, you know, the architectural principles are, uh, you know, I don't know whether we've got them anymore. I don't know what they are. I mean, I sort of, uh, I have great difficulty in believing that uh, the way some architects are operating these days, in fact, you know, we're everything is given over to engineering. I mean, I, I just don't believe it. it, it uh, the, uh, I, I think there's a bunch of rules that I like to adhere to. Mm -hmm. well, you know, the things that have to do with, um, with the, how people use spaces and things like that, things that have to do with uh, uh, not only how people use spaces, but how spaces are in fact used by people, which is a different thing. Mm -hmm. There's very little written in briefs these days that have anything to do with the way spaces are used. Mm -hmm. It's really left, left up to the architect as to you know, how, how things may happen, I think. Now I'm not doing much architecture these days, probably it's probably a reason for that. Nobody wants me to do it anymore. But well, first of all, the idea of uh, there's a maximum distance from the speaker that you wanted to be. I mean, the, 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 the idea of the semicircle was, uh, as far as I'm concerned, was absolutely sacrosanct, as I said earlier. You know, it was to the Romans as well, but uh, uh, it, it, it also was capable of being cut into three different operating functions, and uh, you know, that was a. I, I think that was a bit more than what they needed, or, or they even asked for. But uh, the, also the the other thing was that there had to be the same amount of space. For the people in the convention hall, I think there were 3,500, weren't there? Mm. They needed to be the same that they could go to for meetings after they came out of the main hall. There was, you know, the addition of the spaces beyond the main hall added up to the same amount of space. But they, they, so literally it was a building, it, it held 7,000 people in, in full operation. But, but uh, you know, you, you couldn't say that it was, it held 7,000 people, because most of the time they were doing two things. Now, the, uh, as I recall, the way the thing worked, you, you, you filled the, uh, the kitchens behind the, the parts of the, uh, of the semicircle. You filled those for, for the, the most distant one first, and you worked your way back to the kitchen. I think we were given fairly free one to, to be fair. I mean, if we if there's some 
complaint about that it was our fault, I suppose. Well, one large part of it was with Bob Woodward and the and the, uh, the, the fountain. I mean, the integration of that fountain with what we were doing was very important. That that sort of was beginning to relate the convention centre to the harbour, you know, and, and, and to a, an activity that, you know, eventually was, I think, I hope they keep that thing. That's well, you know, I think it, I'd have to say, obviously, we designed it so it could grow because it was a, it was part of the brief. Well, also, I think it was for more people than finally was stuffed in it to begin with, right? I think it was, I think the, uh, uh, the intended uh, seating arrangement was for more than they finally got, the more than they finished up with. Oh, absolutely. I mean, what would result in, I think, standing today had been if the decisions that were made were made by people who knew the press bloody wine, you know. They, <laughs> you know, that, uh, you know, that was, uh, I cannot to this day understand the, uh, the decision making process that went on to destroy a building that was not only booked out for years in future, but it was performing very adequately and uh, it solved a lot of problems when, when it was built, a lot of teething problems for instance. The major artworks in there were, were commissioned by me to uh, cover up shoddy work. There are, you know, there are there were major flaws in the concrete work that, under the specification, would have the concrete work would need to be demolished, except for the fact that we were able to convince the contractor that they would, we could cover those up with artwork. Another purpose for us. Convention centre, of course, was sort of a. You know, I'd, I'd have to say there was a lot of the. If I say me, I don't mean. Let, let me say us. Hmm? As a firm in the convention centre, we we weren't asked to do all the things that were done there. You know, there were, you know, nobody asked for tall spaces and things like that, and visual, visual things where you can see you know, different levels, and they didn't ask for that. They, they don't brief that sort of thing. I mean, a lot of the, uh, that sort of feeling of the building it really comes from the architect, I think. Please me at all, but... Uh, Okay. It's just the way it is. Okay, why do you think that is? Oh, well, I'd have to say there's a, there's a degree of sort of uh, tall poppy syndrome going. You know, you know, I, I was not here for years, then I moved back here with somewhat of a reputation and that sort of thing. Uh, so there's a, there's still a fair degree of. Uh, Resentment to me mm -hmm. being here, you know, and, you know, it couldn't. Things like that wouldn't happen to uh, to uh, a convention that had been in Canada. It wouldn't happen. You know, that, that sort of the much more you got much more sort of uh, respect, if you like, as an architect in Canada than you got here. I can only think that it's sort of that a degree of jealousy, no question about that. But I, you know, so what? I, you know, I've had a fairly good run here, I suppose, in many ways. I don't think we're taught to value it. Okay. I don't recall. Are you saying academically or culturally? Academically, well, both. Okay. Both. I don't recall any time at Sydney University where I was given to understand we had some things of value in the architectural world. 
you know, we were getting uh, Harry Seidel is beginning to build a reputation for, for uh, you know, modern buildings, but I don't think he did a great deal to sort of support existing buildings. Postmodernism doesn't appeal to me at all. Okay. Why is that? I think it's basically f false. False in in what way? In in what it's in its attitudes and what it's trying to accomplish. And uh, you know, I, what do I think is? I guess also it's based on the wrong premise. You know, it's not based on solving sort of social problems and things like that. More based on on good looks, or uh, yeah, more based on what what's well, supposed to be supposed to be good looking or something. I think I doubt if it was about the financial aspects of it. As my as my information is that it was financially doing well and, and had no problem whatsoever. You know. So it had to be about the society, and it had to be about the the fact that we were prepared to knock down a good building. And who's prepared to knock down good buildings? Mostly architects, <laughs> luddites. You know, I mean, when you think about it. That was a completely irresponsible decision to get rid of either the convention centre or the, the Philip Cox building. Yeah. I'm totally irresponsible. I think I would say that you, you really have to find out for yourself what yeah, what the the pro problem any building what its problems are. Just not take them any notice of anybody else because they don't tell you the truth. And there's no certainly no truth. There's a is eventuated out of the, certainly the convention centre to my knowledge. I have not learnt what I would consider to be the truth at all. It's all just been lies that are stacked upon lies in order to promote an idea to get rid of a building that's a good building. Well, you know, it's an interesting parallel, this, the Sydney Convention Centre, to a lot of what happened in Rome in the, in the older days. They also had the great difficulty with good wine, as I recall. It was one of the reasons for their demise, and it just, it's interesting to sit here and see it happening again. Thank you. So next we have Philip Cox, if you'd like to come down. And we'll uh, pass over to his, uh, Russell's point of view. Well, what a great, um, <clears throat> session that was and what a charismatic man uh, John Andrews is. <laughs> I love him very much <clears throat> but he can also be a bit, a bit my enemy at the same time. Uh, John has suffered enormous amount. I think it's a suffering of the lack of recognition of 20th century architecture and that he has had three great buildings 
mutilated or destroyed. And that is Bill Connan in Canberra. Uh, he's had American Express building mutilated from the original uh, design, which is nothing like the original that uh, he, he did, which I thought was a, a fantastic building and one that responded to environmental analysis uh, far beyond <clears throat> you know, it, its uh, time. And of course, Darling Harbour has resulted in... So there's three buildings <clears throat> which are, were important 20th century buildings which are, are no longer in their present state. <clears throat> and Bell Common, for instance, is largely demolished except for a, a tiny fragment um, uh, with it. Now, <clears throat> I think that um, that's got everything to do with our attitude to society in general. We live in a, a, a trash society, we live in a throwaway society. It's the latest iPhone or the iPad, it's the chuck away situation. Don't repair it, replace it. It's, a, it's an incredible situation that in, you know, as late as the 19th century, we venerated the things that we used, the furniture that we sat on, the houses that we lived in and all the rest of it. Uh, they, were, they were cherished and they were, they were looked after and they were repaired. Suddenly in the 21st century, I think we've, we've got into a new syndrome where nothing is really of value. And it really is fundamental in the in our terms of sustainability um, that it can be recycled. I mean, lots of buildings shouldn't be recycled, but the attitude that one of the criteria that you judge of your um, green marks is it recyclable? Is it can it be demolished and put into other components? Now. <clears throat> That's all very well in, in an abstract sense. But in what we are doing is not valuing our society in a real way. What is our cultural values and how do we see it? And I was very interested in, <clears throat> in the uh, photographic evidence that we have in, uh, in my <clears throat> former days that um, I was most interested in country towns of Australia and, and, and uh, homesteads and uh, root timber buildings and things like that, which really were the foundation of our cu Australian culture. And it's something that is being eroded very, very quickly. <clears throat> we're not venerating what is essentially an Australian culture that we can build on. And the destruction of Darling Harbour is, is a typical example of the lack of appreciation of 20th century architecture and the lack of understanding of what our cultural values are all about, particularly in Sydney. I think Sydney is the greatest culprit. Melbourne has a greater uh, reverence for its, its past and, and to a certain extent, even Brisbane, although politically, you know, it's, it's had difficult times with its heritage. But Sydney had a prime example of 20th century architecture of some magnificence. It is being replaced by something that is less magnificent, and that's my my beef. If it had been the convention centre and the exhibition centre being replaced by buildings of great quality, so be it, you know. But it isn't. The thing is that the fact of the matter is that the exhibition centre is being replaced by something that's inferior. It is not a column-free structure which is required by exhibition. It isn't sustainable in terms of sport. Remember, the exhibition centre contained two or three of the sports for the Olympics. It was able to do that. It was able to stage state dinners. It was able to be made into a vineyard. It was able to have high school um, HSC examinations there. It was for car shows. The whole gambit, it became very much a part of the social situation um, of Sydney and now it is being replaced by a multi-storey exhibition centre which clearly in the industry is highly dubious. It has been compacted vertically by a, a million escalators that will take you, you know, up onto various floors. It isn't column free and it isn't able to sustain the types of activities that um, are being created. And that's nothing to do with the destruction of Tumbalong Park. 
uh, and what um, Colin Smith and Johnson did in the early days with the with the formation of the landscape and the waterways and the and the outbuildings and all the rest of it that gave a human quality about it. Now today, if you go down there, the the scale of the thing is almost terrifying to the park environment. And what Neville Rand tried to do in, in uh, Darling Harbour was create a human environment. And that was the whole premise for the reclamation of Darling Harbour. It was a place for people, a celebration of our bicentenary, and even symbolically, the destruction of our, a symbol of the bicentenary is a shameful thing. There is nothing of the bicentenary to remember now. There are no buildings really of that, of that period in which we can say that that was a celebration of the p period itself. <clears throat> John Andrews is absolutely right. Money is the determinant of the state government. I pleaded with Nick Greiner about the uh, destruction of the two buildings. I said, why don't you re <clears throat> replan the festival markets, which weren't doing too well? Why don't you put the con continue the convention centre if you needed extra space into the festival markets where the the uh, foyers and the entertainment spaces would be overlooking the city rather than being you know secreted within the um, expressway system. And that he said, I was it's too expensive. <clears throat> but that was untrue because they could have bought it for twenty million dollars. Now it's costing them something like a billion dollars, you know, to do what they're doing. It's a scandalous waste of money. And what is most disappointing, it's not going to be satisfying for the people of Sydney, nor is it iconographical enough to attract convention and exhibition uh, throughout the world, which is absolutely imperative if Sydney is to retain its position as a convention and exhibition venue worldwide. <clears throat> now I'm not going to say very much more than that. Uh, Russell Lee, <clears throat> and my partner, is here tonight and he will be continuing on. I don't want to <clears throat> end up by saying we're whinging about it. We're disappointed naturally to walk along Darling, Darling Harbour now. <laughs> it's like losing you know, a member of the family. It's hard to remember even that it existed. It suffered the fate of most great exhibition buildings, as has been pointed out. The Great Garden Exhibition building was destroyed by fire. The Crystal Palace in 18, of 1851 was destroyed by fire. The Paris Exhibition building was destroyed, and so on. There's a litany of great exhibitions uh, buildings being destroyed. And I, unfortunately, uh, our building in Darling Harbour suffered that, and I only hope that the present one suffers the same fate too. <laughs> So the Sydney Convention Exhibition Centre was a significant building for Sydney and a significant building for our practice. Uh, it was one of four buildings that were heroic buildings that we completed in the 80s to celebrate Australia's bicentennial. Of course, the first major exhibition centre as we uh, have discussed tonight, the Garden Exhibition Centre at the Botanical Gardens, unfortunately lasted you know, less than about five years. It burnt down after three years, leaving Sydney without any specialist exhibition centre for literally 100 years. When Darling Harbour was completed in 88, it became the principal uh, venue in New South Wales for international uh, conferences and events. 
and became a key uh, figure in a number of major events in Sydney, including the Sydney Olympics, where uh, it was the venue for boxing, wrestling, weightlifting, fencing and judo, the capacity of over 30,000 people in its space. Since then, uh, the, sorry, going back to its uh, brief, the uh, brief was uh, developed around obviously the existing rail yards and the, key, it was, the idea was that the exhibition centre was going to be one of the key developments along with the convention centre, the festival markets and uh, China's garden aquarium to actually formalise the Darling Harbour and Darling Harbour South precinct. <coughs> it was required to, uh, to be completed by the bicentennial celebrations obviously in uh, February of uh, 88 and it comprised five halls of 5,000 square metres each, but bringing it up to 25,000 square metres. Underneath the facility it had a car park that stretched under the five halls for a thousand cars. The concept was uh, based about four principles. The first one being in the tradition of the uh, uh, major convention uh, facility, exhibition facilities that being built in the previous century, such as Joe Paxton's Crystal Palace. The second one was that it was going to have an, it was to have an integral relationship with a new park that stretched along its uh, eastern frontage. Thirdly, that it was to have a distinct uh, reference back to its maritime uh, history and with the adjacent uh, port. And finally, that it would needed to achieve a 100 metre span without creating a massive scale of edifice. These objectives were mainly met through the continuous uh, use of masts and cables across the structure, which proved to be both economical and also gave it a very low horizontal scale to the building. But its maximum use was uh, made of off-site fabrication, particularly for the key elements, all the steel, major steel components, the uh, wall sandwich panels, glazing, and also the metal roofing. I must admit I love this shot of uh, the huge uh, pieces of steel coming through the streets of Sydney early in the morning, uh, basically escorted by police and so forth to be erected in position. And of course, this building set new standards uh, in a number of ways. Uh, when we actually developed the design, one of the key issues was in terms of occupational health and safety. So this building was actually designed so effectively it could be built without any scaffolding. So uh, all the ceiling and roof and uh, purlins, etc., were basically installed from above. In addition, at that stage, if we had a followed Ordinance 70, which was the uh, governing act of the day, we would have had to have actually built the building out of uh, reinforced concrete uh, to meet its requirements. So it would have probably cost somewhere in the order of about three or four times more to actually achieve and would never have <coughs> been completed by its uh, required date. Of 1988. The building uh, took from conception, design conception, through to the completion, 32 months. <coughs> in its, uh, the building won the Sullivan Award in conjunction with the Art Gallery New South Wales extensions in 88, and uh, the, the uh, jury <coughs> basically recognised in its uh, citation the following uh, points. The greatest achievement of this building is its use of steel and lightweight technologies that test the limits of contemporary steel technology. It met unprecedented time constraints. And the building expression <coughs> is developed from an elegant mass and cable structure that has been able to create large open spaces, large open spaces with the least possible use of materials as it has always been the core of the architects in doing. <coughs> Since that project was completed, we didn't really stop working on the project. There were a number of issues that needed to be uh, developed post its, uh, its final construction. Plus also there were numerous issues that arose that uh, basically the <coughs> Darling Harbour and the Sydney uh, Foreshore Authority uh, requested that we look at to be addressed. They were numerous. Uh, there was obviously issues with the uh, lighting dock and it was very narrow uh, next to the boulevard and uh, that made it quite difficult for trucking in that situation. There was also issues about weather protections for the docks and so forth. 
We basically worked with the authority coming up solutions with all of those issues. However, uh, the budget was never there to actually implement any of them. Uh, in 2002, we won a design competition to actually expand the Exhibition Centre. It wasn't the first time we looked at expanding the Exhibition Centre, and it wasn't the last. And we came up with a solution which actually built to the south and over where the car park used to be behind the uh, entertainment centre. The idea being that the idea being that uh, it would basically link the entertainment <coughs> centre through to the existing exhibition centre and also the convention centre. In it was going to be new kitchens which were going to solve part of the problem in terms of servicing the large number of people who actually attended the facility. But of course, again, uh, when it actually came time for the uh, building to move beyond concept to uh, reality, unfortunately, the government didn't have sufficient funds to proceed ahead. As Philip mentioned, uh, we were asked under the moral rights legislation to basically make comment about uh, what was going to happen to our building. We were given notice that it was going to be demolished and uh, what would we like to do about it and uh, as you probably uh, I think oh, sorry a few people probably appreciate the moral rights legislation is in fact fairly toothless uh, a lot of people feel some comfort that it's there that it will give them some sort of power in reality all it does is give you a notice that they're going to knock it down <laughs> and give you the opportunity to potentially photograph it or, or document it in some sort of way um, we retaliated. As Philip said, we basically prepared our own scheme to demonstrate to the government using their brief how the building could actually be, uh, in fact, kept, retained, and in fact expanded to meet the needs and could become quite an exciting uh, feature within Darling Harbour. In fact, improving the building stock within Darling Harbour and bringing what for the international visitor is one of the prime reasons they come to Sydney actually a harbour experience. And unfortunately, again, the government didn't see the wisdom in that. So I'd like to leave you with uh, one of our very talented staff. Uh, Susan Chan prepared this very short video clip. Susan Chan prepared this just to demonstrate as part, as you'll see, it's titled Save the Centre. The Centre.